Hello there, Lab Insiders. My name is Max, and I'm your host for another episode that discovers everything there is to know about the lab facilities and the scientific industries. Now, today, I have the utmost pleasure to, to be speaking with Ume Uzma Haveri. You are a cancer a researcher by profession. Uh, you have a strong background in this, but you have recently launched your own startup. You've made a pivot from working in, in, in research. Um, you have extensive experience working as a, as a lab assistant, particularly in the, in the fields of cancer research. And you're an alma mater from the Martin Luther University uh, in Halle Wittenberg. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Uzma, you've, um, I guess what really, what I'd really like to start off with is, you know, why this pivot uh, going from research and, and beginning your own startup? Because you you had, uh, you had said you stopped short of, of going into the PhD because you figured that there is, there is more value uh, in, in creating your own uh, digital uh, business. Yes, yes. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for ha having me here, Max. And um, yeah, I made a very uh, sharp pivot from uh, being a researcher to uh, being an entrepreneur. I did that because I felt like um, putting four or five years into a PhD against putting the same four or five years into a startup, uh, a startup would be more fruitful than doing a PhD. Yeah. So, yeah, I I took this weird shift. We've spoken, um, actually, um, in one of our episodes, Professor David Wood from the University of Ohio, he stated that, yes, if you want to get your PhD, you can do it, but you are sacrificing, um, yeah, financial stability in many cases. But people do, you know, go into that. So there is that trade-off. But there is exactly there is this value in before maybe getting that PhD. It's it's starting your own business because that that is sort of that that moment in which uh, ideas start to come around. And you you did discover a need. Uh, it's it's a topic we've spoken about so much on this show: data management and and adapting uh, digitalization in the lab. Yes. Tell us about this emerging issue uh, of data management. There's data coming from reports, samples, notebooks, instruments, you name it. Every industry in the last like uh, one decade has moved towards technology, but like everyone says, like software has been in eating the industry. But I think it has failed science, and especially it's, the life science industry. It's because failed because even now, yeah. in even in the most renowned uh, labs, also we are still using Excel sheets and paper and pen to uh, write down the like humongous amount of research we do is just like scattered everywhere, right? There are a few labs and a few uh, big pharma companies that have systems in place just because they can afford it and uh, also because uh, they have been thinking uh, ahead of the um, ahead and uh, they have figured out um, that this is the future and this is, is this is what is going to save them an immense amount of time and money. When I was working in the lab, I really discovered that uh, uh, all our data was like scattered into pen drives and different kinds of folders and in notebooks and uh, in our own laptops also, right? And all this data is unstandardized because uh, we write and we save uh, all the files and all the data that we uh, literally like take down or make notes of is uh, written in our own language, is written how I understand it or how yeah. a particular person understands it, right? Or processes it. I think that's, that's the reason why uh, digitalization is extremely important. Every industry has moved towards it, I think. It's uh, a peak time for scientists also to uh, adopt a new technology and uh, make the entire research process like 10 times faster. Like from bench to bedside has to happen 10 times faster. We've spoken about academia uh, in particular with Olivier Chevalier um, on one of our earlier episodes of Lab Insider. Um, he, he did state that there was this, this lack of, you know, adopting um, digital tech um, in, in, you know, even amongst the senior students, uh, which meant that once they entered industries, they just, they just couldn't, you know, they, 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 there was such a knowledge gap. Yeah, it was impractical for them to enter some, some companies without, without additional training. So uh, the need is, is definitely there. You've recognized that need because not only in your capacity as a as a, as a researcher of cancer, but also um, uh, you're you're the founder and CEO of your own startup, uh, Labmate.io. Yeah. You found um, you found a need for accountability, uh, for digitization. Um, 
you know, I'd love to talk about the the, the processes involved in, 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 in getting your startup uh, together because that's another topic uh, we've, t- we've talked about on the show, the, the environments, the, the motivations. But um, uh, how, how, at what stage are you in, in, in your sort of in the setup of, of, of your startup? It's quite early stage. Uh, just for, like just uh, um, got my company registered a few months ago, and uh, right now still into customer discovery phase, trying to figure out in which uh, what is my niche and like in which direction should particularly go. But uh, yeah, every day is progress. Every day is moving forward. The small and medium enterprises are in particular very very motivated uh, to adapt this kind of technology. Of course, there is the issue of affordability. So I'm wondering: is the market, uh, is there a, is there a, a large market for um, well leaner, uh, more 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 affordable uh, technologies for labs? Yes, yes, there certainly is because um, there is no solution available that's like plug and play. Like you purchase it and you put it in the lab and you can just like start using it. Uh, large companies have uh, like these Oracle and SAP and like other companies to build custom solutions for them and that costs immense amount of money and time and this a uh, small and medium scale industries they cannot afford to have uh, spend this kind of money and also that kind of time right so there is a huge need for all um for uh, a solution that uh, is um, available to a large scale of uh, uh, like is that can be used by um, the, a spectrum of different kinds of industry in the, in the life science industry itself and uh, extremely easy to use actually like very intuitive like you just like when you start using it you know what to do not very cumbersome like there are a lot of existing solutions also that help uh, manage data but they're an overkill you don't need so many things for a small lab to function right and you and they're very cumbersome and you sp- you need a dedicated person who has learned that software and you need to appoint that person so that he can run the software for you. That that's not how it should be, right? It should be it as easy sound, as yeah. an exercise. Doesn't sound practical at all. Yeah, you need to call that person to make any changes. You need to call the person to if you want to add a new um, template of a sample. That's that's not that that completely kills the efficiency of a lab. It sounds like we have got you know we've got a great user case, right? We've got a. a a strong case here, but I guess every potential adopter will have their initial skepticism. So, so you did mention that there are these these researchers who are very set in their ways, and they don't want to adapt to new, uh, to new digital tech, mainly because you know maybe they've been working in the in the same position for thirty years, and they don't want to you know they're not going to stop now. But I guess when when it comes to you know. Uh, you know, registering, discovering these these new customers as as you're on this stage, um, there are questions that people ask. Server locations, things like that. I mean, what kinds of um, what are the yeah the initial sort of questions that one starting a startup uh, would need to address? Some typical, some FAQs. My an ideal customer interview goes like first with the excitement of the problem, and they're like super engaged, and they like really love the idea, and they're like yes, we do have this problem. And they like very passionately explain all their problems, right? Like, yeah, I, I need this the, uh, something that can save me like one hour of time, like uh, something that I just can just like dump all my metadata in and then just like I can take out the process data from it. Like they explain all their problems very passionately. But then when like if a solution is presented to them, they have a lot of questions like um, how like, how do you how do you trust a young company right because mine is a very young startup a few people like four to five people working towards solving a problem but how do you trust a company like that um and if because it's on cloud that's another big um, barrier the that takes convincing because you have to convince them that data uh, on clouds is also safe it's it's not um, as bad as they think uh, of all these imagined cons that it has right it's it's not as bad, and um, of course we have uh, questions of credibility of how they can trust a uh, a young company like this. For how long are we going to be there? Is sort of the question they ask. <laughs> They're like, if I start using your solution and if I put my data in and if your company shuts down, then what are we going to do? Going back to cloud technologies for a second, because you said that yeah, there there have been people who just don't. I guess they don't grasp it yet. 
they see the cloud as a, as a purely abstract concept that cannot be trusted, right? You've said that you've come across yeah. people that have been skeptical of the cloud technologies, but you stated that, well, there's email providers, right? That's the cloud. Like we're in the cloud already. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so every time they ask me, um, uh, is the cloud safe and how do I put my data on cloud? Then I always ask them, like, how are you sharing your data? Like right now, like today, what do you do? And they all, like one of the answers is always Gmail, right? Or Outlook. They they are using some sort of email provider to send their data, to send their files. And I'm like, that's already cloud, but unregulated. So why not use a regulated platform, uh, regulated by all the compliances, by the regulators, and you put your data there and then use it with your uh, colleagues, right? It is a regulated place and a safer place than uh, Gmail to put your data or to share your data with. As we finally understand the the, the sort of the, the journey uh, of launching one's startups, uh, addressing the needs of the industry, uh, do you have any advice that you'd like to share uh, about your experience, um, you know, in launching a business? My advice is, um, uh, like, I'm very early to give an advice, but one thing that I would like to tell um, people in the industry is life science industry has been difficult. It has a lot of barriers, but uh, there are a lot of uh, young startups already emerging, and I think the industry is ready to adopt. Startup journey is never easy. It's, it is always an uphill task. It's always going to be difficult, but when you uh, find uh, relief and happiness that in, in the fact that you are solving a problem for millions of people and who are in turn working to make the world a better place, I think um, that's uh, that, that's that's enough motivation to keep you going. And one more point I would like to add is that um, I see a, I see very very few female founders in this space, or like female founders in general. So I would um, really like to request young girls to consider this also as a career option to move towards entrepreneurship. Uzma, actually, that is a very valuable point that you made. Um, we, we, we like to speak to people from all around the world, and we encourage everyone to, to, to be a guest on our show. Now, you, you, speaking of, uh, of women in, in the industry, how well do you think women are represented uh, in, in life sciences, in, in startups? Uh, what, what's your overall impression on this? I did my bachelor's in biotech and I've always been working just in labs and in the industry itself, in biotech, by bio, in the biotech and in the pharma industry, right? So I have always been surrounded by women. It's it, in, in life science industry, you see a lot of women. All my uh, bosses and all my team leaders were always women. But when I took this career shift and I went into entrepreneurship, that, that was the first time ever I realized that I am in in a room full of men, right? There is, I think, less than less than five to ten percent of women in a room where there are founders. So the female found like recently I attended an event and I think there were three hundred to four hundred people and only uh, ten to twelve uh, female founders and I was the only one solo founder. Like all of them had male co-founders, but I was the I was the only person in four hundred people who was a solo female founder. So that is the situation. And it is extremely, uh, not saddening, but like awkward and uh, sad, actually. Like it is, it is sad that there are so few women as entrepreneurs where there are like a large amount of women working in the life science, life science industry. So I'm sure they are encountering problems every day. They are... Um, uh, living with those problems and I think they can take this leap of faith and they can uh, move out of like I'm not encouraging them to move out of it but it is a possibility if you have seen a problem if you relate with the problem you can always take a career option of uh, solving that problem not not only for you but like for all the fellow scientists like who are doing work like yours thank you very much for your insights Uzma thank you so much Max it was lovely talking to you that was Ume Uzma Haveri speaking to us not only in her experience as a former cancer researcher, but also as an entrepreneur starting her own startup and explaining the challenges, barriers and opportunities of launching your own business.